2019 was declared as the year of return. I'm not returning. I'm from Ghana. You've returned long time ago. It's not 2019 that you need to return. <laughs> You're based in Ghana right now. Yeah. I want to know your opinion about the year of return. You know, um, first off, I'd like to congratulate the government for at least doing something to try to reach out to Africans, you know, of the diaspora, Africans who are born elsewhere, so forth and so on. Um, now, I've given a few talks about this. They had a year of return conference mm -hmm. and then also uh, the Heritage and uh, Cultural Society Association. And for both of those, you know, what I dealt with was this whole idea of 400 years uh, and starting or counted uh, 1619 is not accurate it's not accurate at all because when we look at the enslavement of black people in, and at least in terms of transatlantic you have to look at 1441 mm -hmm. this is when two uh, portuguese under the charge of uh henry the navigator mm -hmm. uh came and started to enslave black people this guy and antal gonzalves and nuno tristal so uh antal gonzalves he enslaved a black man a black woman uh, and then was later joined by Nuno Tristal, and then they enslaved others, and then they took them across the Atlantic, this time to Portugal, right? Now in uh, 1444, 1445, you had others, um, Lanzarote de Freites, also enslaving over 200 black people, and then again taking them to Portugal. So they didn't walk there, they, of course, that's transatlantic. Mm -hmm. Now, if we now fast forward, you can look at uh, 1502, so this is the first time that you have an African who is shipped across to the so-called New World. Mm -hmm. Now, for those who are counting, 1502 is long before 1619. Mm -hmm. Now, you can also look at the very first revolt of enslaved Africans. This is 1526. Yeah. This was in what they call Spanish Florida. It's thought to be around the Georgia, South Carolina area. So, of course, that's now what is part of the United States. But what is going on with this so-called 400 years is that we're excluding all the half million Africans who were enslaved before 1619 because where they were dropped off didn't just happen to be under British control at that point in time. Now, what's significant about that particular colony uh, called San Miguel de Guadalpe mm -hmm. is that they not only had a revolution, yeah. they were successful and they drove the Spanish out and they became the first African settlers in the modern era. Now I say modern era, because if you look at um, Nana Mansa Musa, mm -hmm. right, he was known for giving an interview with Al Omar, um, among other things, he was known for being rich, for making a Hajj pilgrimage. But on his way back, he was interviewed by an Arab historian called Al Omari. And when he was asked how he became the Mansa, which is the title, he said that he became the Mansa because his maternal uncle had a whole fleet of ships made in order to cross the Atlantic. The first time they almost got there, but there was a storm. They got caught up in a whirlpool, but he and his ship were able to return. From there, he commissioned a whole larger fleet of ships to go across the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. After a few years, they realized that he wasn't coming back, so he effectively abdicated the throne. This is in 1311, right? Yeah. So here we have documented evidence, written evidence, evidence of Africans sailing across the Atlantic in 1311. And this is how Mansa Musa himself is even saying, that's how I became the ruler. If not for that, I wouldn't even be a ruler, right? So that's even long before that. But now to come back to transatlantic enslavement, when I say the modern era, that 1526, San Miguel de Gandalpe, they ended up staying there and yeah. they became the very first permanent settlers, if we want to say, in the modern era. Now, in that same year, you had uh, King Alfonso I. So here is an African in what is now referred to as Congo. Mm. And he wrote a letter to uh, King Jao of Portugal where he was basically begging them to stop enslaving all of his people. He said, they're even enslaving noblemen, my, my brothers and sisters. They're being enslaved en masse, you understand? Yeah. Because Portugal, of course, they went to, you know, what used to be the Kingdom of Congo, which spreads across Angola, Congo, Kinshasa, Congo, Brazzaville, Gabon, all of that area was one kingdom before it was chopped up. But they ended up being taken to Brazil, which is why there are even more black people in Brazil than there are in the United States or any of these other places, because it was so much of a longer time. 
again if we go to 1570 and i'm focusing not just on all the places i'm focusing on the revolutions yeah so 1570 nana gaspar yanga and i say nana out of respect because this is an ancestor uh, nana gaspar yanga in veracruz new spain mm. this is what they now refer to as mexico so he had a revolution and he started his own free re republic that still exists to this day you understand so you can actually go there so you have african people liberating themselves and for those who are keeping track 1570 is again what before 1619. Again, you can look at uh, Palmares in the late 1500s, early 1600s, before 1619. This is a quilombo, and that's what they were referred to in Brazil because it's coming from the Kimbundu language spoken in Angola and places contiguous to that. Also, the same word exists in Kikongo. So, again, you have Africans who are establishing their own free societies. And when I say these are the first free societies, because to date, enslavement hasn't been abolished in the United States. If you look at the 13th Amendment, it says slavery shall not exist except whereas the party has been punished for a crime. This means that slavery exists. All we have to do is say you're a criminal. You don't have to be one. You will be working for free. So your HP, your Dell, all of them, they fund this privatized prison complex. And we can continue on. If you look at uh, 1605, here you have uh, Palenque, the San Basilio. And this is Nana Binco's Biojo in what's now modern day Colombia and they started their own Palenque, which is again another free society. Yeah. And they signed that treaty in 1605 because the Spaniards, uh, colonial settlers, were not able to defeat them. And eventually that treaty was betrayed and then they uh, you know, hung Nana Binko's Biojo and then they quartered him, ripped his body up into four parts, which is what white people have been doing to us for quite some time now. But what I'm driving at is all of these different cases are long before 1619. And there's an African understanding that a person is not dead until they're forgotten. So what we do when we start at 1619 is we erase effectively the entire memory of over half a million African people who were enslaved before that, just on the basis of this fraud, they, they call it Jamestown to Jamestown. Now, first off, the point of disembarkation wasn't Jamestown. Yeah. It was a place called Point Comfort, you understand, which is about 53 miles away from where Jamestown is and it, you get to it long before you get to Jamestown if you're traveling you know up the river that's one so that's not the point of disembarkation but also the point of embarkation was not Jamestown here either it was actually what used to be uh, the kingdom of Queen Nzinga you know our great ancestor so they were taken from what's now modern day Angola and they were taken to Point Comfort you understand yeah. so you have Indongo to Point Comfort apparently that doesn't have the same ring to it as Jamestown yeah, to Jamestown but the thing is, can we base what we're doing on truth rather than on, you know, catchy fraud? So this so is what we're getting you at. You mean that the year of return whole thing is a fraud? I want to say, you know, if we want to just encapsulate it, we couldn't say that. I think the thing that's real about it is that you have African people who are actually trying to connect to Africa, yeah. you know, because of this thing, which is, you know, some of the critiques have been that it's based on just tourism. You're saying year of return as opposed to year of repatriation. Mm. You know, are we just supposed to come here and give money and then go oh. back? Or are we going to get citizenship? Are we going to get something substan substantive, you know, from this? So, you know, I think that it's a good initiative, but I don't think it has to be based on this fraud of 400 years. Because even when people are doing that, they're doing this on the basis of, of some biblical 400 years yes. in wilderness or whatever the enslaved, whatever the thing is. And I actually gave a talk on what was Israel in relation to black people, mm. because you have so many people who, you know, they read this Bible and then they want to identify with the protagonist in the Bible. Now, according to uh, Nana Manetho, mm. quoted in Josephus Flavius, that you had a group of Eurasians yeah. coming from the continent of Eurasia and they invaded into Kemet, the land of black people. They were called Hyksos and they came in, they raped, they murdered, they killed, they destroyed, and eventually they were driven out by Nana Sekenen Retao, by Nana Kamos, and eventually Nana Yamos. You can go and see his body right now uh, in the museum at Waset, what they now call Luxor, the African who drove them out. And he says that these Hyksos, when they were driven out, they went on, over 200,000 of them, uh, to found a town in Judea called Jerusalem. You understand? Yeah. So what he's saying is based on historical documentation, there was no exodus. It was actually an expulsion. They came as invaders and then they were driven out in the very first known war of black liberation in the entire world by our righteous ancestors. But because we're not getting 
our side of the story as documented at that time, you get after the fact these, uh, you know, Hyksos who now want to say, oh, look, we were enslaved, we were oppressed, and, when, you know, we were given this promised land. But that's not what any historical text, and you can read the Stella of Nesubiti Kamos that documents what went on at that time. You can read uh, Nana Yamos, son of Abana, who documents how they pr prosecuted that war. And since then, there's actually been archeological evidence uncovered that actually shows all the places that were mentioned in the text that you can actually find the silos that house the grain for the Kometsu soldiers, the black soldiers. So when you actually look at how these Hyksos, they were called Amu, how they actually depicted at that point in time, they look exactly like the non-blacks who have been fighting against us and killing us and enslaving us for thousands and thousands of years. So once we know this, we'll stop identifying with our enemies of ancient times and rather identify with ourselves. That's the Kometiu, that's the black people. So nowadays you have black people who want to be these so-called Hebrews, which are actually Hyksos invaders, and you have whites who are depicting themselves in Hollywood movies as Kometiu, which it doesn't make any sense. That's the reason why they like to use the word ancient Egyptians, because if they ever started using the word Kometiu, then you have to ask, well, what's that? Well, they'll try to tell you, oh, Kemet just means the black soil. The soil was black, that's what it meant. They'll say, hold on, we got you there too. Because if you read the mythology of the Kometiu, they say that they're made by Kanum out of that black soil. So the whole even mythology of being made out of soil is coming from this exact same black soil. So we got you, even when they try to perpetrate another fraud, when you can read the text yourself, you know it falls apart. From whatever you've said today, I will agree with you that the year of return is a fraud. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about African Americans repatriating back home. They don't have visa free. Mm -hmm. They have to pay for visa. If mm -hmm. you really want them to come back home, you don't think they have to get visa free if it's really the year of return? You don't think so? Well, first off, recently I was interviewed by BBC and they used the term African American and okay. I spoke to the author in very harsh terms okay. and actually issued a takedown notice. I had, you know, uh, my colleague issue a takedown notice to the BBC because there's there are a few terms that I found more insulting okay. than being called any type of American. Okay. As Nana Malcolm X said, if you are American, you wouldn't be cracked upside your head, you wouldn't be put into prison, you wouldn't be second class citizens. Okay. You know, all of these things that we understand. So once we understand this, then we understand that, you know, we're not Americans and we, weren't, we didn't land on Plymouth Rock. Plymouth Rock landed on us, you understand? So for us, we're Africans. We may be born in America. We may be based in America, but we are Africans. And this is even why, you know, I like to use the term commit to you, not only in the ancient context, but in the modern context, mm -hmm. or any word that means black people. Because once you understand that commit to you means black people, this means that the commit to you in Haiti are also commit to you. This means the commit to you in Jamaica are also commit to you. So if we use our ancient terms, our own terms, you understand? Yeah. Because even there's this controversy of, you know, where's the word Africa coming from? You understand? Some say it comes from uh, Ifran, which are caves that are located there in the Sahara. Some say, oh, it comes from uh, Aprique, you know, Greek for sunny or Phoenician, meaning without cold. Others say it comes from uh, Leo Africanus. Yeah. That doesn't make sense because it's saying Lion of Africa. That means you have to be, have something called Africa before you can say this is a Lion of Africa. Some say it comes from Scipio Africanus, which means the one who is victorious over Africa. Yeah. But what we do know, regardless of the etymological controversy, some say it's Afrikia, which is a Berber, you know, ethnic group there. Now, regardless of that, we know that it comes into the English language through Latin, right? Yeah. Once we understand this, and this is after the Second Punic Wars, you have the Romans who are finally able to defeat Carthada, what they call Carthage and Nana Hannibal. And once they do this, they refer to their new, newly uh, conquered province as Africa, the province of Africa. And this is how it comes to the English language. Now. There's a proverb in Kiswahili, they say, Ukirithi jina rithina mambo yake. It translates to, one who adopts a, a name must also inherit its affairs. Okay. This means that if we're adopting the name of a colony of Rome, then we shouldn't be very surprised if we're behaving in ways that are quite anti-black. You understand? Yeah. In the sense of, you know, if Notre Dame Cathedral burns down, you have all these traditional rulers and governments who are saying, let's donate money to rebuild Notre Dame. Well, this is what we'd expect from Roman provincialists to do, because you consider yourself to be, that's the mother country, yeah. and we're a colony of them, let's go contribute to the mother country. But once we start using the word Kemet again, 
in the deepest sense, not as the narrow nation state, but in the deepest sense of what it really means, land of black people, then where I'm standing right now is also Kemet. Yeah. You understand? West Papua New Guinea is also Kemet. You know, Mekamui, what they call Bougainville is also Kemet. Jamaica is also Kemet. All the lands of black people have to come together and more so the black people have to come together. So some people say Africa unite. I don't say that. I say Africans unite. Black people, regardless of location, have to come together in order to defeat our non-black enemies. Just as it's been ever since the very first recorded military document in the history of the world, the autobiography of uh, Nana Weni, where he says that they're bringing together all black people to take military action against these Eurasians. So he mentions those in Ken Sejuru, Wawat, Irjet, Majai, all the Nubians, upper and lower Kemet, east and west of the Nile, all black people are coming together to take military action against these same Eurasians. So for those who think this is a modern thing, it started after slavery, so forth and so on, they say we just became black as a reaction to whites calling themselves white. Well, some of us are literate. Some of us can read the actual text yeah. and we can go back to the pyramid text and uh, 4,200 years ago, it says that you stand as the apis bull in front of the commit to you, which means black people. So our understanding of being black people goes back to the most ancient times. And even Usir, they said that after you pass the judgment and your heart is weighed, then Usir, who's called Kim Ur, which is the great black, then you yourself will aspire to be also like Usir and call yourself one of the great blacks just like that. So this is not necessarily where we are. It's the ideal that blackness is seen as completion. It's seen as perfection. And that's in our African worldview and in our African languages. Wow. This is like a great lecture for me, man. Like, you know, it's my first time learning so much whilst I'm doing a video. So I want to say thank you so much, uh, Medasi. In Swahili, we say Asante Sana. Karibu tena. And um, in Ethiopia, we say Amasa Ganalo. Amasa um, In uh, That's all I know. <laughs> thank you so much. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> wow. No.